Welcome to our first episode of Think Bad and Do Good, a podcast that we're producing here at Attack IQ. And today, in advance of the election, we wanted to focus on um, the Russians looking at APT29 because we just launched an emulation about Russian attackers to help you test and validate your security against Russian tactics, techniques, and procedures. And then we're going to pivot over to threat informed defense and purple teaming for the second part of the conversation. We have two great guests here for you today. We've got Jose Barajas. He's a malware researcher with a decade of experience in the field. He recently gave a great talk called uh, uh, the, the Dirty Dozen. Is that what it's called, Jose, the Dirty Dozen? Yeah, uh, about uh, known tactics, techniques, and procedures. He's a uh, technical director for field here at Attack IQ. We've also got Ben Opel. He's a, currently a captain in the Marine Corps, but he's transitioning out. Uh, he's an expert in purple teaming. He's been um, a member of the cyber protection teams and the cyber mission force within the Marine Corps. And uh, we're very lucky to have both these guys here today. So um, by way of preamble, obviously, like we know Russia is going to target our elections in advance, just like they did last time. They did it in 2016, 2015, and during the 2018 congressional election. So we at Attack IQ produced this simulation because we know it's coming. So Jose, why don't we, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, th thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I think first and foremost, a big driver for emulating APT29 beyond the timeliness of it, given that electors are coming, is uh, MITRE, uh, for those of you that are familiar with them, actually did an APT29 eval um, this year. Um, the conclusions are out, and for every single vendor, we now have a good idea of what the response is to you know, the behavior that we know APT29 uh, employs. So we're trying to provide our customers uh, those same techniques, uh, they may not be a political organization, but that doesn't mean that another attack group isn't also using that tactic uh, as well. Right, because we know the Russians are going after critical infrastructure and they've done it forever. And so APT29 can help critical infrastructure owners and operators. Is that right, Jose? The yeah, emulation, certain, rather? Yeah, certain aspects can definitely help in that we're protecting the assets that typically manage or, or, or control, um, you know, the industrial control systems. Um, Anything kind of further than that, uh, we can do things um, kind of custom. Uh, we've done that before as part of the CES 21, so California Energy for the 21st century. Uh, we've done some work there in the past, uh, contributed some stuff to S4 conference uh, in the past as well. Um, so for more of those in-depth kind of things, um, you know, not any of these industrial control systems are typically the same. So we typically end up building something with our customers based on their needs in those areas. That's awesome. And did you want to show us a slide about APT29? Yeah, I can go ahead and do that and just quickly show, you know, what we're trying to accomplish here. And, and what I'm sharing here with you is actually a nice little graphic that US CERT has put together uh, specific to APT29. Uh, and, you know, while this graphic doesn't go into the details that, you know, our emulation plans go into, it does at a high level talk about how they get into the infrastructure, implant themselves, and then establish communication channels uh, back. Uh, and you know, along those steps, there's a multitude of things that they do to move on from one piece to the other. Uh, so through our product, our customers really can go ahead and make sure that every piece, uh, as we see here, that they have the appropriate control in place and that it's configured correctly to make sure that they're detecting this type of thing. Uh, and if it's not, let's use that, you know, signals that we've generated uh, as a way of introducing, you know, at minimum, a compensating control to detection. That's great, Jose. Thanks so much. I think that's a, probably a good place to pivot over to Ben to talk a little bit about at a high level about what purple teaming is and uh, and how it would counter APT29. Over to you, Ben. Hey, thanks, John. So real quick, like uh, there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, purple teaming is more of a foundational methodology that underpins some larger programmatic changes uh, that we're seeing coming down the line as far as testing uh, as a part of a corporate culture. But you know, it's, it's important to understand that purple is just, we're taking the red, we're taking the blue, we're making sure they work well uh, and efficiently together to uh, continuously iterate and improve defenses. So that, that's, that is purple to me in a sentence. Um, and it may be something you're already doing. It might be something you already understand, but we're trying to codify it because uh, blue and red don't work together well enough these days. And we want to make sure they do, because when we do that, uh, what you get is the ability to actually test against uh, what the adversaries are doing um, on a regular basis. And you actually get benefits, you get value, you get those are the wrong words. I'd say you get um, direct 
simple dashboardable goodness out of doing it this way. So that's awesome. We all want more of that. Right, exactly. I mean, anybody working in the field wants wants to be able to explain the value that they're producing, you know, in term in support of business outcomes, and that's what this is all about. So, really quick, um, tangentially, mostly based on twenty nine. It's kind of an amalgam of threats, but um, what I can tell you is that twenty nine has used all these techniques. So, this is just a map. It's a map of what a purple team exercise would look like. Um, it's got I some love this slide. I there. call it the purple snake. There. Oh, thanks. Yeah, the the purple snake. Uh, <laughs> um, you just reminded me of something else. Anyways, um, we're going to go ahead and assume, you know, that we've done a lot of this pre-planning. We've taken this idea of, of orienting ourselves to our organizational outcomes, our business outcomes, our mission, uh, knowing who would want to mess with it, understanding how they might want to do it, um, and kind of aligning that against our, um, our environment and our controls. And we've kind of listed out what we want to test from that, what's more likely to happen. So we put an emulation up against the control and we run through it. And we do it as many times as we need to until we get the answers and the information we need to make it better. Let me, let me ask you pr practically. So obviously for, for those who, I'm gonna state the obvious. So red is written in red on top. So let's say for the first one under execution at T1086, they're deploying a PowerShell and the blue team response is logging coverage, right? It's a control or a detection that we would use that, that we wanna to test to see if it does pick it up, right? Okay, cool. So like, you know, our logs, I mean, because it's, are we covering the right stuff in logs? Are we, are we, do we have the right queries in our SIM? Are we correlating properly? That, that means a lot of things, but like, maybe I just generalize it for the sake of the map, right? Yeah. So is this, does this, does this chart show um, a chain of actions that they would take? Are these escalating actions that they would take? So the sequential. Um, could mm -hmm. be sequential. There's a lot of interrelationships and kind of parallel stuff happening. Um, it's based off of minor attack. Um, and, you, know, you can look at MITRE ATT&CK as a fair description of the stuff that has to happen for attackers to get to certain places and do certain things, but after a point, it's not required um, that you do them in order. Because um, as soon as I have privesc, privilege escalation, I can go and start doing collection C2 and, and impact. I don't have to worry yeah. about the rest so much. And so you see, do you see purple teaming as a, as a mindset and an operational method? It's a methodology. It's not an actual organization. Uh, it's it's more of a an organizational concept that we use to just optimize the capabilities of red and blue to get them to work together. That's awesome, Jose. What do you think? So I think I think the concept of purple team is definitely not like a department at an organization, but definitely uh, a way that these two groups really interact and work with each other. Right? They each have their distinctions. They each have their specialties, and they also have things that they like to do. Uh, and, you know, in my experience, red teamers don't like to fly around the country to exfiltrate data all day long. We should leave that stuff for automation, right? Um, so those are the kind of things uh, that also uh, red teamers want to find more protection failures, right? Not go back and retest something simply. So this really sets the stage of this is what I've done. Uh, Miter's done a great job of allowing, you know, that taxonomy to be the way that we can interact and communicate with one another. Uh, and, you know, obviously um, the findings uh, can then be replicated through a solution such as ours and other BAS capabilities so that the blue teamer can just hit play. Breach, breach and attack simulation for those who don't know what BAS is. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that way your blue teamer can easily recreate that behavior that uh, was found and can do so at scale uh, while your red teamer is focused on finding additional protection failures. I think that value proposition and that uh, working together um, you know, helps the organization iterate faster than the attacker can. Um, so I think that's the biggest benefit of this. And this just shows, you know, this is how people should work hand in hand, step by step, you know, walking through the purple snake, as he called it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We might have to come up with a better phrase. Ben, could you pull your pull the slide down? Sure. I think Jose so makes a great point. We're talking about scoping scaling. Like we, the adversary is, is um, they're automating and scaling faster than we are right now. And automating a portion, at least, of how we do testing is absolutely required. Um, red teams are never going to go away. They shouldn't go away. They're specialists. They're, they have this mindset of being very tricky and devious and thinking laterally about to break stuff. We need them on our side. Um, but we need them to be innovating and not trying to play gotcha games with everybody. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. So having been in cybersecurity now for like 10 years, I've seen this evolution of um, towards a purple mindset of purple, purple team methodologies. And the interesting thing, looking at U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security Agency, Ben, you and I have talked a little bit about this, is like 
the, the close interrelationship between intelligence and threat intelligence and defense within, within the U.S. military and cyber command allows cyber command to adopt this purple mindset sort of instinctively. And you've seen the cyber protection teams, the, the teams that are responsible for defending DOD networks over time become like very, very, very adversary focused. So these are, it used to be that like net, network security people and network defenders were sort of thought of as just folks who did configuration management or patching. And that's an important part of the function, but they really have to understand the adversary mindset, the adversary tactics and techniques. And so they're taking thinking like an adversary. That's the part of like think bad and do good that I, that I like about the motto. It's like, you have to start out by thinking like an adversary. So great guys. Thanks so much for, uh, for doing this. This is our first episode of think bad, do good. You're going to hear a lot more about purple teaming, um, from attack IQ on our blogs and in, in our, in our podcasts. Um, but you guys have anything else you want to contribute before we close it out for this first episode? Not at this time. It's smarter than me next time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> As Ben's just going to raise his eyebrows. That's his major contribution to closing out this episode. <laughs> Please do more <laughs> eyebrows. Needed, am I? Every episode, every episode. <laughs> yeah. And Excellent. we'll zoom in a little more every episode too. <laughs> just zoom it in, man. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and we'll see you next time.